Welcome. So, so, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Edward Skidelsky, Director of the Committee for Academic Freedom. Uh, so some of you have been asking, so why a Committee for Academic Freedom? And why now? Here's my answer. So round about spring 2020, something in the national psyche changed. Suddenly, the previously impossible became possible, the previously unthinkable, thinkable. It was as if a common taken for granted foundation started to crumble away. And this civilizational gestalt switch was nowhere more conspicuous than in our universities. In my own institution, Exeter, diktats were issued from on high, demanding that we reflect on the historical and socio-cultural contingency of particular Western Anglo-Saxon forms of knowledge, or that we move our teaching away from a white Eurocentric curriculum. Meanwhile, rumors reached me of lecturers and students being investigated and punished for remarks which seemed to me entirely innocent. Strangest of all was the reaction of my colleagues when I tried to talk to them about what was going on. Most of them denied that anything untoward was afoot, or if they admitted it, it was in tones of hushed alarm. I have learnt to keep my head down, wrote one. Sadly, someone like me, perpetually on insecure contracts, cannot express thoughts or feelings freely, wrote another. So how was I to respond to these goings on? Part of me was inclined to lie low and wait. Perhaps this was all a temporary fit of madness brought on by COVID or the government reaction to COVID. But the more serious part of my mind told me that a movement of this sort would not go away by itself, that it would grow progressively stronger and more confident unless it was actively opposed. And these reflections brought me into contact with other academics from across the UK who'd already reached similar conclusions. Together, we began working to set up what would eventually become, thanks to the generosity and imagination of our two founding donors, Ben Dilo and John McFadden, the Committee for Academic Freedom. From the beginning, we realized the importance of strict impartiality. Everyone in recent years has come out in favor of free speech. Free speech, that is, for all except <laughs> the cranks, the deniers, the unpatriotic, the unkind. And the predictable effect has been to discredit the whole principle. Now, any defense of free speech is assumed a priori to conceal support for some particular, probably reprehensible agenda. But, as Noam Chomsky said, if you're really in favor of free speech, then you're in favor of free speech for precisely the views you despise. Otherwise, you're not in favor of free speech. And this uncompromising stance is enshrined in our three principles, which are written up on the postcards you'll see around the room. Number one, staff and students at UK University should be free within the limits of the law to express any opinion without fear of reprisal. Two, staff and students at UK universities should not be compelled to express any opinion against their belief or conscience. And three, crucially, UK universities should not promote, as a matter of official policy, any political agenda or affiliate themselves with organisations promoting such agendas. So if you're an academic at a UK university and you haven't already signed these principles, please do. Uh, since September, we've been urging UK academics to put their name to these principles, and to date, 325 have done so. We've also been keeping a regularly updated monitor of threats to freedom, meticulously researched and written by our manager, Humphrey Allen, and disseminated across the web through the wizardry of our digital manager, Massimiliano Bolondi. These reports constitute the most thorough and objective account of the crisis in British universities to date. And what they show, taken as a whole, is that the pressure to conform comes not just from a small number of radical activists, it's inherent to the organization of UK universities with their vast mechanical bureaucracies and their unprincipled pursuit of revenue. Alongside our moniker, Monitor, we've recently launched a podcast series called Cancelled Voices. Two episodes have been filmed to date with Exeter student Jack Barwell and coming out in just a few days, with University of Reading criminologist Joe Phoenix. And our hope is that these podcasts will show the, the cost in terms of real human suffering 
of the new culture of intolerance, but also the resolve to fight against it. The Committee for Academic Freedom is not alone in this fight. We have also in this country academics for academic freedom, the Free Speech Union, alumni for free speech, and founded last October, the London University's Council for Academic Freedom. So AFAF, LUCAF, CAF, <laughs> FSU, AFFS, the acronyms are bewildering. Um, is this a case of the J Judean People's Front versus the People's <laughs> Front of Judea? One academic asked me recently, quoting Monty Python. Well, I'm happy to say it isn't. The various UK free speech groups differ somewhat in their scope and strategy, but they are all at one in their goal and in their determination to work together. In fact, I can't think of any other area of politics today where such trust and goodwill prevail. And it's a, it's a pleasure for me to acknowledge the generous support we've received from our partner organizations. In August, the Campaign for Academic Freedom will receive an additional boost when the Higher Education Freedom of Speech Act comes into full force. This will give much needed protection to lecturers and students who dissent from the prevailing orthodoxies. But legislation, though necessary, is not on its own sufficient. We need to restore the virtues on which the practices of free inquiry vitally depend, the virtues of tolerance, civility, and liberality of mind. Without these virtues, our universities are in danger of becoming mere clusters of rival dogmatisms held in bay only by the law. The magnitude of the task facing us has been brought home by the survey which we recently conducted of all our academic signatories and which was written up in the New Statesman today. It paints a dismal picture of oppression and fear. And to quote just a small sample of the responses, I live in fear of conflict. I know other colleagues feel similarly. I'm careful to avoid certain topics around students and colleagues. I never ever disclose my views. I've learned to exercise self-censorship. There's a pervading sense that you must keep your head down if you want to get on. I'm very careful now to hide my views about gender definitions, and I'm very much more circumspect in any discussion of my family's Jewish faith. These statements would not seem out of place in a report from Putin's Russia or Xi's China. They shame our democracy and mock our claim to be living in a free country. No one who reads them can honestly claim that there is no free speech problem in UK universities. But I've spoken for long enough. I'm going to hand over now to our main speaker, Kathleen Stock, philosopher and writer. She needs no introduction. Her story is known to all of us as an exemplum of the intolerance in our universities and of brave and principled resistance to it. So, ladies and gentlemen, Kathleen Stock.